Our most valuable resources, creativity, communication, invention, and reinvention are in fact unlimited, says David Greenspoon. My name is Aisha Ogi. I am a creative artist and a communication strategist from Nigeria. Today I have with me Nabila Aguele. Nabila is a dear friend of mine who I've coerced into coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who don't know, the title of this podcast is I love your work. So Nabila, you're right here with me today because I do love your work. I've had the opportunity to work with you over the years. Um, and I remember the first time we met. Do you remember? I do. I do. I've told this story a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> so I met Nabila in the elevator in New York. Yes. And I remember thinking, could this person be Nigerian? You know, and then she speaks with this Canadian accent. And I'm like, okay, who is this? I see the lady next to her. I know she's Nigerian, but I couldn't really um, place who she was or where they were from. And it's history, yeah. right? Yeah, and, <laughs> and we were in New York for Anga. It was 2017. Yes, yes, the UN General Assembly. Um, I think that was like the, the 69th or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. And I remember but, I had been stalking you online for like several years <laughs> at that point. So we need to add that part of the story, right? So you enter the elevator and I'm standing there with the other woman who is mm -hmm. our boss, the Minister of Finance. Yes. And I saw you. And, and then like, she was the Minister of Budget and Planning. Yes, yes. the Minister of State for Budget and Planning. And yes. I remember seeing you and being like... It's her internally, but externally, I was like, stay calm, stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> you came and you introduced yourself at yes. the time you were an essay in Kebby. Yes, And yes, I remember yes. I couldn't help myself because the minister was like, oh, nice to meet you. Yeah. And you were being, you know, respectful I was like, are you guys Nigerian? And, professional. And, <laughs> and I was like, she's a famous photographer <laughs> from Nigeria. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm, I'm really excited to have you here. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to talk all the time. You know, we obviously have a lot of work engagements, connections with friends, family, a, a, a whole, you know, you're my sister right now. Um, but I would love to say first off that Nabila is a lawyer and she has all sorts of degrees. I'm not even going to start listing them out now, but you will help me. <laughs> and she's now the special advisor to the Minister of Finance on performance management and development cooperation. People are always like, what? does that not sound again? serious? <laughs> it's literally two portfolios combined <laughs> into one. Performance management and development cooperation. Yeah. And you know, I've had the opportunity to see you, uh, meet you as a friend, a mother, you know, someone who's had three beautiful kids back to back and still working like that's one thing that i know that i've i've always said this woman is a superwoman it's it was amazing to watch you go through the entire process and still do the work even more because you have there's this thing about you it's times when you're not supposed to be available that you put in the extra i think that's what i love about how you work nabila and i really find that very inspiring mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons i wanted you on the show because I watch you on a daily basis. I see the extra effort you put in, knowing some of the things that are happening behind the scenes that most people don't get to know. <laughs> I'm opportune to know that, <laughs> you know, and I'm very proud. But at the end of the day, I just want to say your history coming to where we are today. I would love you to introduce yourself, you know, let the world know who you are in your own what you feel you are you know that we have different versions of ourselves right, right? Yeah. and that's why that quote resonated with me right i know you're a creative um you're constantly innovating you're constantly having to reinvent yourself based on your history where you've worked where you went to school so i would like to know just let's let the audience audience know who you are Sure, sure. Thank you, Aisha. I mean, this is the first time I'm hearing all of this. Um, bring it on, bring it on. Um, so yes, I'm a lawyer by profession. 
um, but I'm a Nigerian. I know, don't let the Oyimbo, the Oyimbo, the Canadian, <laughs> the, the American, I'm a Nigerian, the... <laughs> Canadian, American, uh, born in Nigeria, born in Kano, mm-hmm. but lived the majority of my life abroad in different countries. So in the UK, in the Middle East, um, and then we immigrated to Canada and to, uh, I then moved to the US for law school. Yeah. Um, and the reason I start there is because this lifestyle of moving around, really because my parents, my dad especially, were very much about being wherever the best opportunities were for them, yeah. has, has always informed who I am, even before I even knew that it was. Mm. So this notion of innovating and transforming and growing and being open to things is something I was exposed to at a very early, early age, age, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so. so that's my background. Lawyer educated in the U.S. Um, mm. Also have an MBA. Uh, I practiced patent litigation. So mm. nothing like what I'm doing right nothing now. Nothing whatsoever. Yeah, I, have a, I have a science degree, a human biology background. My parents are scientists. So there was always this sense that I would go to medical school or mm-hmm. be a pharmacist. Um, I went to law school because for me, advocacy, change agency is always something I've been interested in. Yeah. Ethics. Um, and found my place as a patent litigator, did that for some time, really enjoyed it in the US, but there was always this pull to come back to Nigeria um, and do work here. And so I went to business school and Mm -hmm. then moved to Nigeria after that to to start working for the minister who was then a minister of state for budget and planning. Yeah, but what was the trigger? Like, you know, I I know a lot of people in the diaspora, what they go through Mm. to come back home, Mm -hmm, right? the IJGBs, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? What's an IJGB. I just, I just know it's an IJGB. What is IJ, it? I just, you know, I'm always like the, I just got backs. You know, ah, I just got back. I just got oh, back. Wow. <laughs> so I think yeah, it's IJGBs. Yeah. Um. So there are people who come to Nigeria for the holidays. You know, yeah. they come, they they enjoy the best of the best of Nigeria, right? Mm. And they expect that's what it's supposed to be mm-hmm. all through. Mm-hmm. So for you, staying in all these different countries and coming back home and to come to serve, it wasn't like maybe it was a business opportunity or like you had some you know, opportunity that would drag you here. I wanna know like what was the trigger? Mm. Why did you decide I'm going to come and do this? Right, mm. so this is a great question because if anyone who knows me, who had spoken to me maybe even two years before the move, would never have expected it. Yeah. Um, even as we were moving, a lot of family, friends were like, are you sure? Even I was like, am I sure? <laughs> so the first thing I would say is that it was a journey. And even as we were going through it, there was still a question in my mind as to whether I would fit, yeah. whether this would feel like home for me. And I think it's so important to say that because it's a natural feeling. It's what a lot of people go through. Yeah. And I think for those of us who were raised in the diaspora, there's always this pressure to focus on coming back and yeah. immediately blending, blending and in being <laughs> like everybody else. And I think that's the biggest mistake anyone can make. Um, the truth is, um, for us, it was a conversation. So my husband and I had been speaking about it for quite some time. I, he also lived abroad. He also yeah. lived abroad. So we met abroad um, and we got married here and then moved back um, to the States. Um, so we, for us, the motivation was first and foremost opportunities in Nigeria, being at a stage in both our careers where we were mid-career professionals mm. and it was a low risk move. We hadn't yet started having kids yeah. and we were both at that point where it was either we left the West and we came and we tried and if we tried and it worked great, if it didn't, we moved back. But we knew if we started having children and got settled, it would be a much harder move. Yeah. Um, we took several trips. I would come back as an adult even before I got married mm-hmm. and really started to try to get a sense of who I was in Nigeria yeah. apart from my parents and my family. Because <laughs> yeah. those two things are completely totally, different. Totally, yes. Right? <laughs> you have to find who you are, who are mm-hmm. your people, who's your tribe here. Um, and so it was work that attracted me here, opportunities, yeah. and then knowing that we would be able to experience living at home, um, something that I hadn't experienced since the age of seven. Yeah. Um, and for him, he's a tech entrepreneur, so being in the Nigest space where there's so much opportunity. Yeah, in right tech, now, yes, um, yes. So it's kind of a no-brainer for mm-hmm. us. Oh, that's excellent. You know, I, I know, I know that when you guys moved back, obviously. You went through a bit of trying to settle in, you know, what city, would it be Lagos, would it be Abuja? And mm-hmm. this is just me knowing behind the scenes, right? I think I look at the kind of work that you do and I think obviously because you've been able to travel, mm. you know, you've explored the world, you've met all sorts of people. 
and I watch you interact, it doesn't matter where anybody is from. Nabila finds a way to connect one way or the other. They connect with you too, so it's not like you're trying hard or anything. Mm -hmm. Do you think having that exposure has helped you mm -hmm. and how? So it absolutely has. I mean, I will say I am an extrovert mm. um, at my core, so that helps. I love people in general. I love meeting new people. Yeah. I think growing up all over the world, the first thing I realized very early is that people fundamentally are the same. Mm. Wherever they are, no matter the color of their skin, no matter the religion, our fundamental core needs, worries, the things that we value, family, togetherness, community, feeling a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, those emotions are the same wherever. Yeah. And so what I find I do is I look for those opportunities of connection. So if I meet you for the first time and I know you're a creative, I'm yeah. a creative, that's where I'm going to start. I'm not going to start from the place of difference because yeah, once you start there, you'll never stop looking. But a lot of people do that yeah. though. Like the first thing is, okay, <laughs> where are you from? Yeah. You know, I think one of the major questions we get is what tribe? You exactly. look like so, so and so. You don't sound like so, so and so. It's like exactly. you're constantly want, wanting to be put, people want to constantly put you in this box of who you are supposed to be what you're supposed to look like what you're supposed to sound like you know and, and that's why i said i remember hearing that accent and saying okay i know this is a nigerian face yes. <laughs> you know but it's it's it was interesting to me yeah and i think we blended immediately i think we even remember i remember meeting you guys you and your husband on the street um the day after yeah. we met or yeah. something and so i get that and i understand that it helps you when you have that global mindset right it helps you to to connect with people i think even in the work environment when especially now post covid yeah there's a lot of online work we get to interact with more people from around the world right you know you went to you had your mba um i believe it was in at INSEAD. yes yes so nabila is a board member of INSEAD. The and main board. The main board, yeah, the board of, of directors. INSEAD. I'm yeah. so proud to say that because <laughs> I don't think we have any other Nigerian that has done that, right? No, no. On the global sta scale. So Nabila is one of the board members of INSEAD. It's an, if you don't know INSEAD, please, Google is your friend, right? It's one of the top business schools around the world. And how did that come to be? Like, I know a bit of the history, but let's, let's tell our people, how did you get on the board? And I know you're on other boards too, so... Right. We're adding that. Right. Please. Ooh, so the INSEAD board, um, I think my perspective on it is, so I'm an alum of INSEAD. I mm -hmm. went there. That's where I, I got my MBA. And at INSEAD, I found a real sense of community. So for me, you know this about me, that yeah. sense of community, belonging, wherever I am, if there are opportunities to add value, um, to lend to that community, yeah. um, I'm going to do that. So for me, INSEAD was a place where I was able to really deeply reflect at a point where that was what I was looking for. Mm. And, and I was really wrestling with these notions of who am I? Am I a lawyer? What am I trying to be, especially as I transition to Nigeria? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, the board role is really an extension of things I was already doing as an alum. Um, I was active as a student. I was president of the um, African Business Club. Yes, I, rem I remember did that. Did a number of other things. And then just organically um, became active when we had our fifth year reunion. I yeah. was a young alumni volunteer. Um, so those are alumni that work with the school around yeah. fundraising. But let's pause. Before we do that, I think you, you did volunteer and you had something to do with inclusive Yes, yeah, so and that was later. That okay. was actually, yeah, that okay. was actually. Okay, so I wanted to know if it was the yeah. same. Yeah, okay. so I was a young alumni volunteer, young alumni ambassador before mm -hmm. any of that. So just quietly, and there, there are so many young alumni ambassadors, so I want yeah. to really give credit. Um, it's just those who work with the school, particularly around fundraising. Yeah. It's a private institution, so alumni funds really matter. Mm -hmm. And for me, the connection was that it wasn't just fundraising in the abstract, it was fundraising towards scholarship and inclusion and helping the school advance its mission around business as a force for good. Yeah. Um, so I, I was one of the people who organized our class reunions fundraising mm. um, and just organically became close to a number of school administrators, the dean of advancement, yeah. the, the overall dean, and started having conversations behind the scenes about just how the school is run, yes. um, things we can do better, things I enjoy, things I wanted to see more of. 
Um, and then in 2020, there was an opportunity to join the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, which mm -hmm. was a task force of alumni, school administrators, staff, really looking to help the school advance its mission around inclusion, which a lot of schools were doing at the time. Yeah. Um, and I had also served on the campaign board. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, that's, is, that's a lot. Yeah, which is the school's <laughs> All fun, while doing an, an extremely hectic MBA. Fundraising. <laughs> and, and, you know, I find your question a good one, but it's also a difficult one for me to answer because yeah. I can't really sit here, here and say, this is why what I did chose yeah. me to be on the board. Um, I think what I would say is it's a great opportunity and platform to continue to advance um, a mission around business for good, mm -hmm. uh, Africa focus. I'm an yeah. unapologetic um, proponent of more Africa engagement, more Africa representation and diversity as a whole. And the school um, buys into that. There's an Africa initiative. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work around sort of advancing diversity, particularly where there's lacking in, uh, there's a lack in representation. Um, and it's just, it's just fun. Yeah, it's but fun. you see, it's fun for you. <laughs> and I think these young people need to understand because it's going through these processes that you learn a lot of things yeah. and you learn how to push for change, yeah. right? Because this is, you're talking about these topics are really serious topics especially in connection to the sdgs and mm -hmm. where we need to be in life mm -hmm. you know and being part of a system where you can contribute you can actually change policies you can add value and change the way people think yeah it's it's extremely important yeah and i know even in nigeria we have a lot of like student unions and you have people who learn a lot of good mm -hmm. and still also pick up a lot of bad yeah but you can see the difference when they reach a certain age in life and they reach leadership positions you can tell that they picked up a lot of things just from university mm -hmm. from adding value from being a volunteer you know and volunteerism for me is such yeah, a big deal yeah it's a big deal because young people are waiting to be called yeah you know young people are waiting for someone to say oh can you do this or that but you could actually volunteer yeah. you could add your services you can learn yeah you can be an intern you know i think that's probably one of the things i want our listeners to pick up from this especially if we do have a younger um, set of people a lot of the things we do in our life we look back like now i'm 42 Oh my God, I'm 42. <laughs> we both are. We're both 42. <laughs> but there are people who think we're in our 20s. I know, right? FYI, we are not in our 20s. <laughs> we are grown women. I am old. I don't <laughs> think there's anyone that thinks I'm in my 20s. People but... think I'm in my 20s. I sure they do. <laughs> they do. But you know, I'm just saying that I look back now mm. and there's so many times in the past that I was being grumpy about either a situation I was in yeah. or the job I was doing or the school and then now I look back and I see all these skills that I picked up yeah. in the past yeah. right so with everything we're saying here I'm just basically saying I see these things like mm. you know when you see a person that is full mm. that is full with like full to the brim and has a lot to give it comes from experience it comes from learning it, it comes from giving yeah and I love a lot that. of it comes from giving yeah and i see you go through this every day like regardless of whether it's clear or not mm -hmm. you're constantly giving you're constantly give you're not it's not always about look let's take 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 and i think we we need a lot more of that in the world not just in nigeria but i think a lot more in nigeria yeah you know we need people who are selfless yeah. just like you are yeah. and that's why for me it was so important to have you on here you know you. that selflessness that constantly thinking about the general group you know constantly thinking about how best we can get things done efficiently efficiently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're very put together even though we know behind the scenes we're all scattered it's chaos it's ca organized, <laughs> it's organized chaos, chaos. <laughs> it's organized chaos but yeah. you come out of it so beautifully it's like i think the analogy i would use every time i think about this is that butterfly effect mm -hmm. right and then maybe a ripple effect it's like you don't know this nabila but you just it's a little drop and it just oozes across and you help people to rethink what they're doing without even without effort without making them seem like they don't really know what's up you know what i mean oh thank you so Aisha. that yeah 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 i love that about you. you so i wanted to pick up on two things that you said and really yes. emphasize them the volunteering piece yes volunteering is not a nice to have 
for anyone who wants to be a leader or yeah. add value, it is necessary. It is. And what I would say, especially for young people, um, young leaders or emerging leaders, and even people who are our age, because mm -hmm. it's not just young people. It's not, to, yes. It's everyone, <laughs> it's really. Everyone. It's everyone. Um, anyone you admire, any leader in the public space, look at their bio and look yeah. especially at what they were doing when they were young, before mm -hmm. they arrived. Um, no one got to where they got by not volunteering their time, by not, not being doing, available, yeah. not saying yes to opportunities. And everything you've described, the work that I do with INSEAD um, and with other organizations is volunteer. It's professional work. It's unpaid. Yeah. It's giving of yourself and your time. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it's not something we should fake. So yeah. what you volunteer on has to be an extension of who you are, what you value, what gives what you you're purpose, passionate about, what you enjoy, because that's when you want to do more of it. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes too many of us, and we're all in danger of this, are trying to chase the perfect idea of mm. what a leader looks like yeah and what that leader is supposed to do rather than saying who am i what drives me what excites me and then what are the opportunities and where are the spaces and communities yes. where i can thrive so we're going back to my first quote right mm -hmm. it says invention and reinvention right i think the creativity side i'm gonna have you on the podcast again mm -hmm. i'm holding you to it sure <laughs> And then the communication side will keep that yeah. for another. Well, I'm going to focus on invention and reinvention. Mm. I want to go back to when you were a you were a lecturer. Yes, I was a law oh professor. Oh my God, yeah. a law professor. Yeah. Nabila was a law professor. And I, I, I want to go back to that. Like, what was it like teaching? Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It's one of the best jobs I've ever had. Um, so basically, after law school, I clerked for a judge, and then I practiced at large, two large law firms, um, and had an opportunity, was invited back by my alma mater, mm -hmm. uh, American University Washington College of Law, to become a practitioner in residence. So essentially, yeah. practitioners who come back and teach full time for a period of two to three years in the clinical program. Um, for those who don't know, law schools, um, both in the U.S. and even in Nigeria, have what are called clinics. Yep. They're nonprofit law firms where faculty and students and practitioners provide services to um, individuals, companies, sometimes governments, yes. uh, CSOs. It's very high impact and also community grassroots. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had an opportunity very serendipitously, um, and it really changed me. Um, so I grew up a lot in that space. I found my voice yeah. um, as, a, as a law professor, as a practitioner in residence. Um, I found community, I, and I also began this journey toward working less to try to be somebody else's version of what I should be mm. and more about saying what are where are the moments where I feel excited where I feel magic where I feel like I'm alive alive yeah and to mark those moments to be conscious about chasing those moments mm. moving forward and that experience was one of them yeah um, I, I, I gained so much because really in the clinical environment you're not just sort of teaching at a podium you're working with students mm. as they come to terms with who they are as professionals yes. as lawyers before they go into the legal profession um, you're helping them grow over a period of a semester or a full year and a lot of it has to do with interpersonal relationships yeah. how do they relate with their fellow lawyers how do they relate with clients especially clients who come from different backgrounds yes. um, different countries different cultures so we talked a lot about um, cross-cultural lawyering mm. uh, ethics in lawyering social justice and lawyering um, and it was it was amazing you know I, I, I want to say this because I know for me whenever I teach younger people I tend to learn mm -hmm. is there any particular story that you can remember from then mm. of maybe one person yeah. that you learned something from yeah. you know there's a student um, a stu we had so many special students and I taught for two years there was a student in my first cohort and she knows herself she's really special <laughs> I'll send this to her um, and public speaking was like her kryptonite Aww. I mean she was super passionate heading up like a leader across so many different things mm. like her CV was stacked but if you asked her to get up and speak yes in front of a class in front of I mean, she would, it was like mortifying. Oh for her. my gosh. And for me, what was amazing about that experience was watching her growth, mm. not just over that year, but subsequently. And the lesson there was that growth is a journey. Yeah. And what you give to people, especially 
you know, and she's someone who a lot of people could have said she's an introvert. She's never going to get this public speaking thing. True. We leave her alone. But we worked at it. We encouraged her. We talked to her. And that blossoming, that butterfly effect, it, it continued beyond our time with her. Lovely. And for me, it was a lesson in what you give people, what you expose people to, mm. how you treat people, whether you're a, a, an intentional mentor or not, it stays with them, both yes. good and bad, yes. well beyond your time with them. And we really need to be conscious of that. Yeah. Um, and she took so much of that, even the things that we didn't know that she was taking at the time. Wow. Yeah. I, and I, like I keep saying, in retrospect, you're always smiling. <laughs> these kind of things but at the time you're not really thinking yeah, it through yeah. I think that's it's very important for us to cons constantly have self-awareness mm. because this is someone you could have just written off mm. and say you know what she's never gonna get it like mm -hmm. you said and then toss it to the side and she'll probably forever be mortified yeah, and she tried so hard she it's tried. like me I, yeah. I, I, people don't know like you have butterflies it's yeah. like even just before we started this like my heart was racing right I think it's a natural thing but not letting it take over mm -hmm. is such a great thing. I think that's such a great lesson yeah. from that. So I'm bringing us back home mm. to our work now yeah. <laughs> and what we do. We're not going to go too deep into it. Um, I think I have just a few more minutes sure. left. Um, but I would say in the Nigerian space, what we've been through in the last couple of years, you've been here doing this for what, six years now? Six years, yeah. Six years. Six and a half, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I wanted to bring in invention, reinvention, right. right? You've been a student, you were a lawyer, you've worked in other spaces, and then you come into public service. Mm -hmm. How do you, like, do you feel it's molded you and changed you in a different way? Or are you still the same person moving from when you came here? So, yes and no. Right. Mm. I mean, we've talked about this before. I think part of the tr the key to the reinvention mm. concept or adapting, I like adapting, adapting. Um, is that you want to adapt and grow in a way that allows you to relate with and integrate into the c communities and the workspaces that you're in without losing the core of who you are. Yeah. So the way I always see it is I should be recognizable to people who know me mm -hmm. wherever I am. So if my friends from the U.S. come here and they interact with you and other colleagues, they see me interact, of course they're going to say, this is Nabila in Nigeria. Yeah. But I shouldn't be a completely different person because I've changed 100%, myself yeah. to, to be in this space. Um, I've grown a lot. I have to give credit 100% to our boss. Yes, our um, mentor. <laughs> our mentor. Um, she's like a mother. She is she amazing. She is amazing because the truth about growth and reinvention and transformation is that you can't do that if you're around or working for someone who doesn't let you who don't give you that space yes, yes. who want to mold you in their own image mm -hmm. to be carbon copies of themselves that's how True. some mentors and many, are <laughs> we have <laughs> a, a lot, lot of, of that over that here way. yes um, but what she's what she's done very subtly and very um, not overhandedly has has been really giving me the space to bring myself to the work. Yeah. Um, and I think the work that I'm doing and supporting around gender is a great example of that. I mean, uh, from excellent the jump, example. I was always yeah. like, what are we doing about women's equality? <laughs> people, people would be like, aren't you at budget and planning? Exactly. Like, you know, and now... But uh, we've gender, achieved, yes. Now gender, especially mm -hmm. post-COVID, is one of the most relevant issues, particularly for development and yes. developing economies. Um, so it's definitely... I think you need, we need to talk about the win. Yeah. We need to talk about the win. Yeah. The gender-based planning. Yes, the gender-based For Nigeria budgeting. to have it. Gender-based budgeting Amazing. and planning. Amazing. And, and I think it's just the beginning. It's, it's just, just the, the beginning. beginning but, reform. you know, this is your work. You, the minister, the team, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel it's such a big deal for Nigeria yeah. moving forward and especially for the women of Nigeria. Yeah. You and know? I think I think with the gender responsive budgeting. So with anything, mm. budgeting is a function of the budget office. right? Yes. And, and what we have in the current DG budget is somebody who gets it. 100%, excellent. Um, excellent. Who is very much uh, someone who sees 
budgeting the budgeting process as a holistic aspect of making the people's full lives picture, better yes. and so when the discussions around gender responsive budgeting started and these conversations happened even before we came to finance before I even was, was part of those conversations mm -hmm. um, he's always been someone who has been open to it and has been very pro reform yes and it's so important because at the ministry level there's always a sense, I think from the outside in, there's always a sense that it's the, the ministers, the, the politically appointed figureheads yes. that drive, and they do. They do, they but, do. But, but you know, you get to learn heads, from the inside yeah, and the see. the agency heads who have to own the work and have yes. to actually drive the transformation at the agency level, um, that's where that's where you really need the buy-in yeah. um, and the leadership, and we have it at both levels. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was very, very happy about that. I think I would add to learning and mentoring mm. right you have people who can take the time out to sit you down and listen to your problems and then you have those that you learn on the job it's mm. like constant mm -hmm. and i think one thing i love about our minister is her level of patience yes and just constantly looking at everything like every document that comes in yeah she she's would very meticulous very meticulous very thorough, very thorough yeah you know well planned you not just because she's our boss you know mm. we're not trying to mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like Anyone but i'm saying say this, this is yeah Anyone but this is this. what we've learned yeah and i think for me who my level of patience ha has not been really great over the years yeah i know i can reach a certain point and then i snap mm. but working with her over the years for me that level of patience and just constantly seeing things beyond just what is in front of you it's like if someone does something the first thought process is, oh, this is what this person has done. Mm -hmm. But for her, it's more like there must be something else happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Is this person okay? Leading with compassion. Leading, yes. With and, and learning. Yeah. And, and I feel for us too, we have a lot of young people that we speak to, you know, and I may fall their hand, mm. as we see in Niger mm -hmm. <laughs> from time to time. But at the end of the day, you get to see and learn. And it, for me, I feel watching the interactions not just my own but even with all of us in yeah. the office interacting with her yeah has been a learning curve for me Absolutely. you know i think that's one thing i've been very happy about from our work together because now we're on the same level exactly of work. exactly exactly <laughs> See, no more the legal i'm a legal child by proxy i'm mm -hmm. a lawyer by proxy mm -hmm. We, we still have time. You can still... I could, my mom is still <laughs> expecting me to go to law school. You can still add school. that degree. <laughs> <laughs> that ship sailed probably like 20 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. We'll see what happens in the future. But you know, I'm very, very happy to have had you on the show, Nabila. You. you know you're very dear to me. And I love your work. Thank you. And Thank I you. love yours too. And I love that you're creating this platform uh, yeah, for people. I just hope, you know, uh, people listening, even if it's just one person, get something from this. I'll be very happy, Same you know. Here. So I look forward to having you come on. And we're going to discuss creativity and communication. I can't wait. Thank you for coming, Nabila. Thank you for having we me. We did it. We did it. <laughs> And with that, I look forward to having someone new next time. It might just be Nabila again. <laughs> but see you guys soon. Thank you. <laughs>